Good afternoon, everybody. Um, a very warm welcome to all of you. You are all heroes. Uh, you made it to the hero room. And uh, we thank you for that in the afternoon uh, to a parallel session, but you will not uh, regret it. It will be an exciting uh, panel and you will learn uh, a lot and we will exchange a lot about, of course, artificial intelligence as a tool for judicial actors, promoting access to justice, human rights and the rule of law. And some of you know uh, that UNESCO has uh, built over 10 years a large network of judicial operators, uh, which we have been training uh, at 35,000 altogether on, for example, freedom of expression and access to information and human rights law in this domain and the application. And just two or three years ago, um, uh, many said, okay, can you do something on digital uh, and AI? Uh, because I wanted to learn more about it. We did a survey and responded with a MOOC which had in the first uh, five weeks um, 4,000 people who went through it and the Supreme Court judge from India wrote to our Director General how fantastic it is. So it gave us a lot of drive and energy and, um, and also opportunities of course to continue and, and we have uh, built from that and have uh, developed a global toolkit uh, which is still in draft uh, format but I want to show it to all of you who are interested because you can learn a lot of things in this toolkit. Um, and it is accessible. We have tested it um, in many, in the three, in three regions so far. The last time with 18 countries in Latin America, um, but it is still not the final version. Um, uh, but it is already very rich for those who want to learn more about it. Uh, today, um, I have the privilege and pleasure um, to to have an, uh, a um, high, um, uh, very. Um, qualified uh, panel and series of panelists uh, with me. We're still missing um, Sedina, uh, whom you, some of you might know too, um, uh, will join us in a second. And um, I will, uh, without further ado, I will introduce to you the panel or will, um, just uh, with the names and uh, the moment I mean, the panelists will speak. I will say a few more words um, on them. So uh, we have uh, on, on the left, uh, John Taylor. Uh, or oh, I will say just now, uh, who, is, uh, who is, of course, one of the real uh, machine learning professors and also an AI chair for UNESCO, but also uh, the director of IRKAI, the UNESCO uh, center in Slovenia. Um, so thank you for joining us and he will give us an opening remark in a few uh, seconds. So I, I could hand over to you now for the opening remarks and we'll introduce them later. Thank you. Um, yeah, so just to say maybe a few words about the uh, Eakai Center. So it's a, as um, uh, was mentioned, it's a Category 2 Center, uh, UNESCO Category 2 Center, dedicated to AI and sustainable development. So it sees as its remit, uh, in a sense, trying to promote the uh, rethinking of AI in terms of uh, understanding what it can do for humanity rather than what it can do for particular businesses. And I think one of those areas clearly is the judicial, but I think more broadly our aim is to promote understanding of AI in the general public and the benefits that AI can bring, but also the, the dangers and how we need to rethink perhaps some of the judicial approaches in order to address those dangers um, or to offset or head off at the pass those, those dangers. Um, so one of our core thinking uh, is around the ethics of AI and trying to understand how we can build a better understanding of ethics of AI that is practical, that is implementable. And I think the, um, you know, in, in some sense, our center is trying to bridge the technical in that we are you know, bringing technical people to the table with the uh, implications of the applications, be they you know, practical medical applications or climate applications or in the judiciary. So in a sense, I, perhaps I would just add one 
sort of thought that uh, I don't really consider myself a panelist here. I'm just saying some introductory remarks, mm -hmm. but I'll, I'll chip in if I can. But, um, but I, as I don't consider myself a judicial expert, but I, what I would say is let's not fall into the um, mistake of thinking that AI is a finished subject or a finished discipline and that we have to work with what we have and make that just uh, the, the, the thinking fixed into that particular set of systems that we have before us. Those systems have been developed with particular interests, typically a, a commercial interest, and they may not be the best way of designing a system if we were to think of it from uh, approaching from an ethical or, a, or an initial ab initio uh, stance. So I would encourage us all to think about what we would like AI systems to exhibit in terms of their properties and, and uh, operation in order to make them more fit for purpose for the particular application, and in this case, let's say, the judiciary. And I think that many researchers would be very welcoming of input from domain, from people with domain knowledge in order to understand what the desiderata are, what is the thing that we should be looking to develop, and that you know AI is a very, as I say, fast-moving subject, and maybe there will be the potential to develop solutions that would deliver a better result for judicial applications than the ones that we have at the moment. So I'll finish with that thought. Um, thank you, John, so much for these opening uh, remarks. Yeah. And I'm, uh, we will be uh, speaking about both the opportunities and threats and, of course, the need to strengthen the capacities of the judiciary. But all of you will be delighted to hear uh, that uh, ex applications exist. So today you will first learn about conceptual approaches, so which areas can be uh, in, in, the judges, uh, in the judiciary be enhanced uh, through AI. Uh, but we will then also uh, speak about the technical aspects very briefly and concrete uh, implementation and application um, and, and then going back to some governance uh, uh, principles. So we will cover a lot uh, of different domains, including practical applications. So, um, so I think that uh, everybody will enjoy. And I invite uh, now immediately uh, Gregor Strugin um, to, to introduce us uh, to, uh, the, to the also uh, conceptual, technical, and implementation-related operational issues. Um, uh, some, and, and set the floor like that. And just to, to introduce you, um, I have. Uh, so, Gregor is a specialist IT and IP law um, uh, lawyer, and he worked at the crossroad of technology, information, and law since 2002, and uh, primarily at the Supreme Court of. Uh, Slovenia, but also at state sec as state secretary um, at the Ministry of Justice. He's the vice chair of the Council of Europe's Committee on AI, former chair of CAHAI, and the Slovenian representative to the European Commission on the Efficiency of Justice and uh, the CyberJust uh, Working Group. So he has a very good uh, experience and background of over 20 years and will us give us an, and set the floor in terms of the conceptual and the, the technical and operational issues. Thank you. Thank you, Cedric, and uh, hello. I'm happy that the room filled up despite they put us in the cellar. Uh, so um, AI is a general purpose technology, and any sectoral discussion requires us to distinguish at least the following categories of issues within any ecosystem where it's used. And uh, like Cedric said, conceptual, and we can also address technical and organizational issues. So let us start with conceptual. Uh, Martin Luther King said that the true peace is not merely the absence of tension, but it's the presence of justice. Sounds good, right? But what is justice? We can have very different ideological views, and uh, we can also look at it from the perspective of distributive versus procedural fairness. Do we look at the results uh, in an objective manner? Everybody gets uh, the same sentence regarding uh, looking at objective elements, or are we looking at 
the outcome if the procedure was done correctly. Analysis is in Slovene system, but also abroad show that procedural fairness is more important than distributive uh, fairness. But to avoid a sociological analysis, uh, we can address it in a more operational manner. Justice as an effective dispute resolution process. And uh, in order to see where AI can be used, we should first identify what are the current problems that are seeking solutions in dispute resolution. One is access to information, the other is speed, the third cost and effectiveness of uh, the tools available, predictability of success, security, sometimes also privacy of procedures, this is why many choose alternative dispute resolutions, fairness rarely comes first or even in top five or ten elements of what users are seeking. It is subjective and dependent on the interests of the parties. What is fair for one is not usually fair for the other. Systems vary, but regardless of this, we can distinguish that we have different stakeholders, operators and interests at play. And many operators in the existing system play the role of an intermediary. And some of these roles of intermediaries can be automated, are being automated and will be automated. We are already seeing this in traditional settings. For example, access to case law lowers the need for basic legal advice and orientation regarding how to proceed with an issue. Use of AI for research, analysis and drafting changes the roles of assistants, both in attorney's offices and in courts. Uh, automation of different tasks improves administration and efficiency. Specific, exa specific examples from Slovenia include speech to text. What used to take four times as long as the proceeding took to transcribe the, uh, what was said is now done in one quarter of this time. And you can use the human resources for other tasks. Uh, it can be used for data and information extraction, especially in large, uh, large case files. It's being used for anonymization, case law search, knowledge-based utilization. Some of the approaches, however, are bordering on disruptive. We are seeing the impact of attorneys' use in the courtrooms, where they are using AI to adapt their cross-examination of witnesses on a micro level. They're looking, they have a digitized case file and examinations are usually uh, used to show the trustworthiness of a witness and of a statement. And traditionally it was done in a more conversational manner, but now it can be done in a way that it effectively disrupts the witness because you can use AI to find the most appropriate response to the answer or reactions that you see in the um, interrogated or examined witness. And this is lowering the credibility of testifying witnesses and affects, can affect the outcome of cases. It brings about the, que the question of equality of arms, especially if just one side is using this. What's even more worrying for me as somebody who has worked for a long time in development of tools for judges is that now ju judges want to use the same tools. Mm -hmm. um, but to avoid details here, separately, but perhaps even more importantly though, is automated dispute resolution, which has been offered for quite a long time through major retailing platforms, but also other systems. They are lowering the number of consumer protection cases coming to the courts and employment dispute cases coming to the courts. And this is starting to overtake traditional judicial making. Of course, it's not necessarily re related to AI, but we heard yesterday that we didn't address uh, internet or digitization adequately in the past 30 years. So now we are starting to see some of the issues and we are equating them with AI maybe we have a chance now to solve some of them or at least address them. Um, why is this? Here we can transfer 
our discussion into technical and organizational issues that are influencing development and deployment of the technology. Overall, and as a consequence, I would consider that inequality of arms is the key risk when it comes to the use of AI. Inequality of um, opportunity, opp opportunities or inequality in terms of equality in general between um, within the procedure that is traditionally set up to provide equality. But achieving this depends on the ability of the state as the one responsible for providing a system of rule of law to comprehensively address the issue through governance and regulation. Why? Not for regulation's sake itself. But if you want to have the ability of the state to limit some rights of case parties, for example, to prevent the attorneys to use such tools in the courtroom, you need to do it in a legal and equitable manner. So you need some sort of regulation to, be, to have a judge who can say you cannot use this, at least in Europe. Of course, we have different systems. What is also crucial is that we extend these rules to as wide part of the dispute resolution chain as possible. For two examples, one, case law and access to legal information can be problematic if these systems are available but biased. For example, you can have a case law system with uh, falsified case law in it or biased case law depending on the user. Additional challenge, operational challenge for courts or um, state players who are developing simple operational and business level integration of solutions requires specific knowledge and understanding. And this starts with procurement, benchmarks, warranties, liabilities, post deployment, monitoring, and if needed, ad adaptation of the tools. And this is something that is often lacking in the public sector, but is prominent in the private sector, not on nation level, but globally. So what we are seeing is we could have global monopolies starting to dictate how dispute resolution is being performed on various, in various nations. So these are just some of the questions uh, coming from the conceptual, but also organizational and technical aspect. Thank you so much, Gregor, and this is really uh, an exciting presentation. Um, you spoke about uh, text-to-speech, speech-to-text, um, and but also disruptive uh, applications in terms of cross-examination uh, and automated dispute resolution. Um, just to tell all of you, you will be invited to ask questions to the panelists, so uh, be ready at a later point. We will interact, make this an interactive session. I already would challenge some of the smaller things that inequality of arms is the biggest uh, challenge you said, but uh, we will hear other panelists there too and continue in the first place um, with um, the next panelist, uh, and that will be um, uh, Virgish Futa. No, no, uh, sorry, it will be Vanya. Uh, Vanya uh, Skoric, and I will introduce you uh, now by uh, highlighting that you're prog pro program director um, uh, at the Netherlands-based European Centre for Not-for-Profit Law, overseeing global and European engagement programmes with 20 years of experience in legal analysis, research, litigation and strategic campaigning. And, um, and I'm happy uh, that we had this conceptual uh, view and approach, but we'll now hear really about some of the implementation uh, challenges and, and opportunities uh, too. And I hand over to you directly. Thank you so much and uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, uh, we'll try to make this uh, uh, as interactive as possible, so uh, we'll go quickly into the implementation part here. And I'll start with a quote actually from this lovely book, uh, the UNESCO's AI Global Toolkit for Judiciary, a shameless plug-in again for, <laughs> for our moderator, uh, that says human rights-based approach is essential to build trustworthy AI systems in public service delivery. And I couldn't agree more, so that's why I'll be framing uh, this inter short intervention by merging human rights 
rights-based uh, approach and the calls for investment into implementation processes that we heard yesterday and today from the main panel. And I'll build on the examples. I'll give just a couple of illustrative examples of the use of large language models in judiciary uh, from the 2023 study in Latin America, uh, where they looked at the main risks in the implementation. Uh, with findings uh, showing that most of the judges that used uh, ChatGPT, for example, um, to motivate their decisions did it without actually thoroughly examining whether the information was correct. Uh, then one of the risks was uh, automation bias and over-reliance uh, on, on the answers. There was a lack of key information to assess whether the data sets were biased or uh, caused the discrimination in any way. There was no explicit trace in the decisions uh, whether the judges effectively checked the responses as accurate uh, from coming from the AI model. Um, and then there was also something that said judges would require a significant time to actually check the correctness uh, of some of the uh, and validity of some of the AI generated answers which then questions the whole concept of you know, whether it's more effective to use AI or to not use it. Um, and then there was also a study, a new study uh, by Stanford and the Institute for Human-Centered AI uh, that was just released, I think, a week ago, that finds uh, disturbing and pervasive errors among the m three most popular LLM models on a wide range of legal tasks. So you can Google hallucinating law. It will bring up the study immediately, and uh, it says that hallucinations rate ranges from 69 to 88% in response to specific legal queries uh, for these models. And that the models often, often lack self-awareness about the errors, uh, they tend to reinforce uh, the incorrect assumptions, and again, the findings significantly question the reliability of LLMs in legal context and access to justice. Uh, so that begs the question, um, actually, maybe that John brought in the beginning. You know, whether wh what is suited for the purpose, you know, and whether uh, what is on the market currently is actually the thing that is most suited for for the goals that we are trying to achieve, and wh what can be done in terms of implementation, and you know, the, what we heard this morning, the agile policy making. So the argument is not not to use AI or large language models for supporting access to justice. The point is how to assess those systems or build those systems from design phase, uh, uh, including the examination and the testing and the impact uh, assessment before it's used. So when, when the potential impact can be mitigated or, or the human rights uh, consequences have been thoroughly assessed uh, and then use adequate tools and measures uh, to actually uh, um, address them. And mind you, these tools and measures to address the impacts need not be technical alone. Um, so the premise is that having a robust assessment ex ante, so it, before the use, uh, can serve as a really strategic mechanism for governments and public institutions to, to, to really build responsible use of AI. And of course, having in mind that necessity and proportionality uh, are the key uh, and ultimate ratio here, depending on the context and the use case. And so there are some existing frameworks and a few methods floating around to assess how AI might impact uh, human rights uh, and all the issues that are at stake uh, for the rule of law. Uh, in this uh, uh, toolkit, there are also included sections on impact assessment. However, what we see missing is a process uh, within the public sector, how this is to be governed, uh, what are the criteria for having a good, meaningful, robust impact assessment, how this process should be embedded, institutionalized, uh, so how do we bridge that gap? And I would here echo what, what Gabriela Ramos actually said yesterday, and, and this was a call from her welcome note to, to invest in the government sector capabilities and capacities to embed the safeguards for the uh, safe use and implementation of AI. So to invest really in order to yield uh, the benefits. And, and uh, we would argue that by incorporating such robust criteria uh, in, in uh, AI impact assessment processes, and especially if they are embedded in the public procurement or public design of AI, 
this can be a proactive approach actually to AI accountability. And I have to say in, uh, in collaboration with the Civic AI Lab at the University of Amsterdam, uh, where I also do research, we, we did come up with the criteria for impact assessment with critical uh, five components uh, of these criteria. One is the normative framework, so having scope, content, benchmarks, uh, and enforcement mechanism uh, played out and, and laid out in rules. Second one is the process, so having the stages and procedures and roles of different uh, stakeholders and assessment team independence really uh, uh, elaborated. The third one is methodology, so indicators, benchmarks, balancing, or what the industry likes to call the trade-offs, uh, and uh, what we lawyers like to call proportionality and necessity test. Uh, then engagement, so identifying which stakeholders need to be engaged, the methods of engagement, how to include uh, different external, in particular, stakeholders. And the fifth one is oversight, so documentation of the process, publication of the results, and finally communicating that to the public to build trust, monitoring, and feedback. So I'll stop here, uh, and I'll just say that uh, my organization managed to advocate for some of that language to be incorporated in some of the policy processes that are ongoing uh, regionally and globally. The latest one in the upcoming UN uh, General Assembly resolution on uh, AI. And we really hope that this can be a part of the kind of convergence process um, uh, within uh, different policy making um, areas and, and processes that are going on and maybe something to think about for the UNESCO's readiness assessment process, uh, whether that contains enough information for a robust impact assessment uh, to help countries uh, embed uh, some of these criteria into their governance framework. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Vanya. And, uh, and just to mention here too, because you mentioned uh, investment into capacity development in this domain, I would like to thank also the European Union who is supporting our project and this, uh, this work. It is like something like a, a curriculum too. Um, so so uh, just to acknowledge uh, that here and to thank you uh, because uh, you did very well in, uh, in speaking about concrete implementation and uh, then going to the ex ante, uh, also before uh, rollout um, assessments, very structured way, but looking at governance. And now we're coming back up uh, to the high level uh, views to governance. And uh, most of you have seen uh, Sedina uh, sorry, uh, before uh, on different panels uh, because he is a member of the UNSG's high level advisory board on AI. And, uh, and many of you have seen also the interim report uh, here on governing uh, AI for humanity. And, um, and uh, but I will say it's the, the right uh, things for your introduction uh, too. And uh, because you're also uh, um, uh, the di uh, okay, everybody knows you're leading AI expert from Senegal, um, but you're the director of the program Open Training for Reinforcement of Competencies for Employment and Entrepreneurship in the Digital Sector, Force M. So thank you for that and for being with us uh, and so bringing it up to the governance uh, yeah. level. Thank you, Frederic. Hi, everyone. Uh, so yeah, uh, uh, in the context of governance of, uh, of AI in the judiciary sector, it's important to, to, to think about uh, the impact that could be uh, on a human beings so in, in, in this sector. So just to emphasize some uh, significant as aspect we can consider in the governance. Uh, first, it's um, about transparency and, uh, and uh, explainability because it's important when you use uh, AI system to, to, to deliver uh, a sentence or something like that to explain how you, you, you what is the process to 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 arrive uh, uh, to, to to this uh, uh, to this conclusion so it, it's important to have uh, the explainability and the transparency to 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 have the decision making uh, process and second it's about uh, fairness and bias mitigation we uh, we we all know uh, about, uh, I don't know if, if you know Compass. Uh, there's a study uh, who shows that in Compass, there is some uh, bias uh, 
because of the, the data used to, to train the system. So uh, when you use data, who could have bias because of the cultural uh, 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 things or something like that. Uh, we it can show a bias in the delivery of the the the, the sentence. So it's important to to think about it when you are uh, you are doing the the, the governance. Uh, another thing is uh, accountability and responsibility because AI system is built by engineer, it, it can be uh, delivered by company and used by judges or some, so something like that. So in the global chain of the, the decision making process, you should have uh, a governance of uh, how to uh, think about uh, the, the, um, the accountability of each uh, stakeholder. Um, Another thing is uh, data privacy, B because when you use uh, data for training, you have to use real data. So it's uh, it's important to think uh, about uh, uh, how to 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 deal with that the data privacy and the security of the data, the security of the system too. It's important. Um, the other thing is, uh, in, each, in, in some cases, it's important to have a uh, human. So uh, if the human oversight of, 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 of the process, it, uh, it, uh, should be, uh, it should be guaranteed. And uh, you should have the human control too, not uh, automatic system uh, doing, uh, doing, doing, doing all, all the, the process. One thing uh, important is about standardization because it's important to have some standards. Um, so we, we, we have to think uh, about it when we uh, have the, the, the regulation or something like that. And the other thing is uh, the certification. So when the AI system is built, it's important to, to think about how to certify that this is a good system which can be used in the process. So it's, uh, it's, it's very important. And uh, what thing to think about um, on governance is how to build uh, public trust. Yeah, it's important because uh, when you use it, we have to have the public trust and the public engagement if you want to use a system like that. And um, another thing is uh, interoperability and compatibility with systems because usually the system is not a, a standalone system, it is a system communicating with other systems. So it's important to have these uh, norms, standards, and uh, something like that. And um, the cooperation too, international cooperation, or if it is uh, in, 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 uh, in uh, the US, it could be between states to, to share uh, good practices to, to learn about uh, failure of uh, good things uh, happen there. Um, and uh, last but not least, I want to emphasize about ethical guidelines because uh, uh, at the end, there is human being using this system. So it's important to have uh, ethical guidelines uh, who will be shared uh, between all the stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Seydina. And uh, you, you closed on the ethical guidelines. Thank you for that. <laughs> it's uh, opportune, but uh, you mentioned bias, accountability, the multiple hands problem. So we don't, I mean, it's an entire chain with accountability and responsibilities, human oversight, standardization, interoperability, and so on. They are all in the ethical guidelines too, dimensions, as many of you might know. Um, and, uh, and it is good to, to look 
I mean, at all the different AI applications and areas through this lens. And I think it is a very good translation of that. Thank you for that. And now uh, we will also go, uh, and I will hand over to, to Frigish uh, Futter, who is the executive director of the Mauritius Emerging Technologies Council. And he has spent much of his career in uh, uh, and on the African continent working with leaders of organization across different um, areas on uh, leveraging the potential of uh, technology. And it is really great uh, as an example because it gives us also an, a country application perspective. Um, and uh, so over to you and to share. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Cedric. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so uh, maybe from, from our side, I'm, I'm not a legal expert per se, uh, more technology side. So when we uh, we think about the applications of AI in the judiciary system, um, uh, Africa has a tendency to leapfrog technology. So we kind of um, see what's happening, we test things and do things. So on, on our side, um, one of the things that I shared earlier with, with you that we did was um, to create a sort of a, of a private GPT that is an expert in the labor laws of our country. So uh, it basically knows everything about the Workers' Rights Act of our country, it's still on the test phase, but the, the results are actually extremely surprising and pleasant. Uh, um, just to give you a scenario of its application, um, uh, what we did was, um, one of the things that does happen in a lot of countries, including Mauritius, is um, a lot of people that actually uh, lose their jobs uh, or end up trying very hard to find the right legal uh, counseling, the right legal support, you know, to ensure that their rights are followed and everything is ap uh, applied. So now imagine this scenario where you have in your pocket a, a chatbot that can actually guide you on that. So you basically share the information of, I've been working for X amount of years with this company, this is the salary I was earning, um, uh, I've now recently been told to leave uh, for the bigger reasons, um, is the compensation that I received correct or not? So what we have seen is the AI is able uh, to actually calculate the right amount uh, of compensation that you're supposed to get. Uh, while getting this information, it goes even further. You can uh, ask, okay, what are my options now? What am I supposed to do because of that? Um, it will actually tell you, uh, you can write a letter to the HR department, you can actually go to the labor office. Um, eventually it writes the letter, it gives several recommendations. Uh, at the end of the day, what we see now is uh, we are making it a service that is accessible to the public, uh, which is a major issue. Uh, we're trying to bridge that digital divide through a quick use of AI in the judicial system. This is what, what, what we call it. Obviously, we'll have in your short-term, middle-term, and long-term planning of how to, uh, to uh, uh, implement it. But um, we are trying to move... Uh, a bit fast, but uh, at the same time, uh, being careful about all the regulations and, and the governance around it. It's not yet released. Uh, obviously, as you can, you can imagine, it will create a lot of questions in the legal field with lawyers, even unions. Uh, but this is one of the things that we're looking at, uh, at least on a country level. Thank you so much for this concrete uh, example and highlighting already some of the challenges you see ahead <laughs> coming towards you uh, when launching the system too, uh, very concretely. So um, uh, just a heads up to all of you, we will hand over the mic to the room soon, but first we will ask uh, those on the panel here to comment, ask questions. We want it really to be a dialogue uh, between experts and the public. Uh, so I, I'm happy to to give the floor to any of you, first to question any of you, and then to the public, or to comment, or to compliment. So uh, I will just repeat the question that I had before for um, Brigash. How did they create a system that was able to uh, calculate the amount of damages? Because I assumed that there would be a need to look into case law, etc. Uh, it, it sounds uh, complex, but um, it's actually very simple. Uh, our laws cater for very specific things, like the number of month works, and it's very uh, detailed. So once those uh, kind of, uh, I would say, the rules are in built in the system, it becomes easy for it to calculate that. Obviously, you need to give, I won't go into technicality of things here. I don't think it, it, it's the right platform for that, but obviously you need, you need to give uh, certain rules, like when, whenever we need clarity on certain information, it asks for the information back. 
Um, so in this way, you are ensured uh, that uh, whatever you're getting out uh, is actually referenced. So basically, it just not only gives you the, uh, the right amount, but also gives you the reasoning behind, uh, which act helps the user um, uh, get an informed decision at the end of the day. Um, now, th this platform is not only meant for citizens, for everyone, but it's also meant for those uh, in the actual departments of organizations, which we were talking earlier. Um, sometimes those people, they're not bad intentioned, if I can say it that way. It's kind of can be a lapsus or something that they have not seen. We are doing it constantly. So th having access to such a tool, <coughs> AI driven, can give them the, the reassurance that um, they have some kind of, uh, I would say, artificial intelligence backing in whatever they are providing uh, to them. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that uh, AI could be used uh, widely in um, in the power legal uh, work, but with judge, at, in what extent could we use uh, AI to to help judge uh, do or doing uh, the job? Well, many ways are already being. Um, tested or are in production. Uh, mostly, I think, AI is used now for years uh, in the private sector for drafting. And this is one of the challenges, because it can create an infla inflation of input to the courts. But uh, in the courts, uh, we are... Um, using both traditional machine learning uh, and now we're experimenting with generative uh, tools. And traditional machine learning, one of the aspects is uh, speech to text that I mentioned. Then it's allocation of cases, etc. Some Some of the tasks that are quite simple. Uh, but if we limit it to the decision-making process, um, the highest use that we see is uh, harmonization of existing case law and uh, support to maintaining the historical memory, both on individual and institutional level. For example, we have uh, a number of similar cases that uh, can get uh, decided in a different way just because there is a lapse of memory on the side of the decision makers. There can be a different formulation by the same judge two years ago or now, and this can influence the interpretation of case law. So you can use uh, case um, the analysis tools to help you identify and also suggest what can be written. But where it comes to uh, decision making alone, um, the current president of the Supreme Court once asked me, so if I use a very good GPT and I ask them to write a decision for me, can I ask it to write a decision in this or that direction? So you can see that you cannot rely on that. Of course, it will do that, but ultimately the decision on what goes out is in the hands of the judge. Maybe just a question for Gregor as well. I mean, is there a role, there's a lot of talk about human-centric AI and, and the idea that we're actually making people uh, better at doing their jobs and you know, more informed decisions. Is, is it fair to say that that is the goal that we should set ourselves in terms of divine, designing systems for, let's say, judges to make decisions in a more... Um, careful and full way, and is a, can I AI play a role there? Oh, definitely, but I, I would start with looking at what are the actual needs in the system, and these needs are different in different countries or different for different stakeholders in the systems. Mm -hmm. For Slovenia, one of the main challenges is to have a variety of um, useful language models for Slovene language that can be uh, utilized in different tasks and experimented on. Then we will see what we can use the outcome on. Currently, unfortunately, I think it's only OpenAI's model 
that's sufficiently good for Slovene language. I think this might change in a matter of weeks even. But then there are other issues. How do you finance that, etc.? But um, overall, mm, I think that support to uh, procedural fairness that I mentioned before is, could be one of the key directions. Can I just, just to add, my only plea is please do impact assessments before the use. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Uh, if, I, if I can add, everything that uh, Sedina said before, yes. <laughs> everything is already absolved both by Sepesh ethical charter and what we did at Kahai. I think it's, uh, of course, it's necessary and also risk and impact assessment. Uh, when I mentioned the equality of arms, I think it's one of the key aspects that y that's unique to the balance that is required in the ecosystem of justice. No, no, I have, uh, I have my own questions and points, but I would like to give to the public. There are several uh, people who would like to speak. I think with the cameras, it would be good if you come to the front so people on the web can follow you too. And uh uh, First of all, hi. <laughs> Mary Hickok, Center for AI and Digital Policy. Uh, Thank you so much for your inputs. Uh, my question is going to be both to Gregor and Vanya, because you both mentioned procurement of AI. And procurement of AI by public sector happens to be a, a specific research area of mine. So where do you see um, the process currently in your respective countries or areas, countries of interest? Second is, do you think that would be a single, could be a single point of failure for bringing in AI uh, systems into the public sector, into the public infrastructure. That should have been there. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, just to expand on that, yes, uh, <laughs> a little bit. So there is currently, at least in the EU, uh, draft model uh, procurement clause uh, clauses. Uh, so the full, uh, I mean, you, you can search it online also. So. I think it's called the draft EU procurement clauses uh, for both high-risk and non-high-risk AI uh, for the procurement in the public sector. Uh, my only caveat there is that the, 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 the whole process that I was mentioning, the impact assessment, is only one line uh, in that procurement process, where I, whereas we as researchers, uh, at least a, a lot of research uh, community that I uh, speak to, really see the procurement as a point of opportunity to embed some of the safeguards, procedural ones, uh, and even share the burden, if I may say, with the private sector company. So it, it's not the onus only on the public institution and the, you know, the capacities and funding on the public institution only, but it's a shared burden then with the public, uh, with the private uh, vendor or, or or those who are interested to sell their product to actually demonstrate that their product is compliant with human rights, uh, with safety requirements, and all of that that is needed, right? So, so yes on both, and no, it's not fully developed yet, uh, but it has huge potential. A uh, couple of cities, including the city of Amsterdam, for example, do uh, already Im uh, employ that. Helsinki as well, they have good models uh, for procurement uh, of AI that includes these types of clauses. I don't know if you want to expand on that. Um, we could have an entire conference, I think, on this issue. We should. We should. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll just point out a couple of uh, elements uh, related to this issue. One is uh, how do you set up the criteria, um, especially if you have a small market? Um, how do you set the benchmarks? You need internal knowledge, but how do you get internal knowledge if you're limited with public sector salaries? Uh, then usually European Union countries rely on EU funding which is provided for the f future five years and you need to plan in advance on the basis of the cost that you had in previous five years and how can you do that with uh, AI technology. So there is a bunch of very technical operational issues but ultimately, um, 
it will require restructuring of procurement both on inst individual institutional and uh, public sector level in general. Um, thank you so much. This is so exciting to dive into um, also these practical aspects. And thanks for another question. Perhaps you come here so you, oh, can, be sure. you can see the panel and, and you can invite people on. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is for Fania. Um, thank you so much for bringing up the importance of doing impact assessments <laughs> before uh, deploying an uh, AI product. My question, you mentioned um, the procedural challenges that we have into implementing those, um, those tools. Um, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on a specific aspect of these procedures. Um, and it is, according to you, who should be doing these impact assessments? So definitely the, the rule of the thumb is the <coughs> independence of the assessors, right? So if we are talking about public institutions, uh, there needs to be uh, an independent assessment team. Whether they are from within the public sector or a combination, uh, these are, there, there are many possibilities, uh, but they need to, com so first of all, they need to have independence of their own, and second, they need to be interdisciplinary. So you cannot have only data scientists doing the impact assessment. You need to have people with a I don't know, privacy law background or ethics background or uh, domain expertise. If we are talking about you know, developing a, uh, something for the judiciary, obviously you want to have judges there uh, involved as well. Uh, so it kind of has a, a two-level uh, two structure. One is the actual team, assessor's team, that is assessing uh, the, the, the DI system, and another layer is external stakeholders that need to be consulted, right? So they can also be somebody within the different public institutions or within different bodies that need to be involved as users, but often what is lacking is consultation with the, those ultimately impacted. So for example, in, in, in the case that you mentioned, I would also be interested to hear, you know, whether, for example, the, the, the workers uh, what, what they would say in, uh, you know, testing these tools uh, or, or using these tools that you are proposing, whether they had some particular additional input or whether they, uh, you know, saw it as useful or, or, or um, uh, burdensome or, you know, to what extent the input from the, let's call it the general users or the, or the impacted users was uh, taken into consideration. So the, these are not quick processes. Uh, there are no quick technical solutions to some of these processes. And I think we need to kind of also internalize that and be okay with that, that some of these will take time and debates, but ultimately it's all for the best result, right? Mm -hmm. I would add to that example also that, of course, the users of the system will have to input uh, their salaries over the years, uh, and so there's a privacy uh, dimension to, to add. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Gandun Gataug uh, from the UNESCO Regional Office for Eastern Africa, uh, in charge of social and human sciences. Uh, thanks for the uh, intervention and for the panel. Have a, a small question that will go the other side actually of the conversation so far because you have spoken more of the tool used by the judges to facilitate their work. Uh, now, from a recipient perspective, that is criminality, AI-powered criminality. How ready are the judges to address that uh, as well? Uh, that, that's mainly my, my question from anything uh, uh, the use of AI in the cultural and creative industries vis-a-vis -vis intellectual property uh, to any crime that would be committed using AI. How much are we ready uh, to that? There's there more questions, so I ask us to be short. I'm sure as an IP lawyer <laughs> you would have your views on that too, Vanya. No, no, Yes, perhaps we, because we're, we're, uh, we have about five minutes, so I wish to collect questions now, and then we have a last round uh, and close uh, for the next session. Thank you. I'm, I'm Cordell Green, Executive Director of the Broadcasting Commission in Jamaica. An observation and, and a question. Um, I think uh, Sedina, you, you raised the question of um, explainability as, as a challenge. 
I would want us to interrogate that a bit, particularly when it comes to the question of access to justice. I happen to believe that understandability is perhaps more the priority for the judicial sector. Explainability sounds very much an engineering concept to me. And I don't know that explaining uh, the mechanism of a complex black box system is going to help access. I think we would be more helpful if people were to understand um, the decisions and, and use of AI. After all, that is the very purpose um, for requiring judges to give reasons for their decisions. And then, um, uh, Gregor, I, I think we may have to not run away from some base principles of law, authority, and uh, 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 precedent. We don't take up every journal and everything that is written and offer it in court as an authority. AI, chat GPT-3, is not a legal journal. So I believe this is really a question about professional ethics and less a question about um, artificial intelligence. The journals that are considered authorities in law, there is a reason they are considered authorities in law. And I believe we ought to apply the very same criteria to any other mechanism or authority on which we are relying. AI, in my view, is not an exception to that rule. So I'd like to hear your comments on that. Thank you, Mr. Green. You have support um, on explainability and authority ver versus hallucinating <laughs> uh, AI systems. Um, yes, so I think there will be several people. Let's take that as a way I, I will facilitate the next session. So I have an interest to keep a, a time <laughs> for once. Um, so let's let's make a final round. round I will quick. Uh, I will start at the end. And uh, absolutely, and I addressed this issue partially when I spoke about the case law uh, database search and that we already have a problem because we cannot verify whether uh, providers of not, not only GPT, but even case law databases, are they comprehensive? Do they include all the case law? Is there something added? Is the data manipulated? You need transparency. And transparency is also the answer to the previous uh, question uh, rather than explainability. You need to know on what uh, data set and on what presumptions was the algorithm or the system based. To the first question, Yes, evidence especially is going to be a problem in terms that uh, currently with uh, deep fakes, uh, we can, as even just with deep fakes, we can see a problem of how we will evaluate certain uh, evidence that has traditionally been quite uh, solid. For example, voice recordings. Um, I think this is this cybersecurity game that's been go or any security game that's been going on since uh, cat tried to catch the first mouse or the amoeba tried to catch another amoeba. We will develop these tools and other tools will develop. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Gregor. Now I will give everyone the opportunity in, in less than a minute to have a few final remarks if you wish. Um, be very quick, Cedric. Yes. Um, on the aspect of criminality, and just oh, one quick point, I think uh, it reminds me of a heated discussion I had with a friend of mine who was a lawyer. Um, we always argue that the law will always play catch up with technology. Um, and it, that is probably what will keep on happening throughout the years. We are right now at the very stages around AI, um, and regulation will catch up. Eventually, we'll be surprised along the way. And, and one of the best scenarios that a friend shared with me uh, that kept me thinking is this this year half of the world nearly half of the world we go to elections um, we all know that um, and in the democratic process just imagine two days before elections we have a series of deep fakes uh, roaming around on every social platforms everywhere election day <laughs> people have made their mind based on those deep fakes AI generated 
and have costed their vote. Close of elections, the results are out a, a week later, then they are told, those are deep fakes. What do we do? I don't have the answer. I'm just saying those are the scenarios that we probably need to keep on thinking about and, and, and keep on moving in terms of regulations. That's it. Thanks, Cedric. Thank you. So I, I, I'm totally agree. Uh, understability, uh, understandability. It's uh, it's uh, it's 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 important when when you are faced to the judge to understand what, what you, those the process is. But when you are building the system, it's important to have uh, to, to 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 have this kind of uh, uh, to 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 to, exp to explain how the system works. Because it's important to 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 have knowledge about the decision making process. Because uh, without that, we can have a complete black box, and uh, it's dangerous to have a black box for 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 some kind of uh, uh, AI system in the judiciary system. Just quickly, uh, because trust was mentioned a couple of times, uh, and I think the, the final users of, of all of these uh, tools are, in a way, citizens and, and, and individuals. Uh, they will not have trust unless we actually provide uh, the procedural safeguards, the explanations, the understanding. Uh, so all of these kind of maybe even boring uh, uh, parts of the conversation uh, because they are less exciting than you know building a new AI, uh, but they're very, very important for actual use and then trust building. These are the important governance and implementation uh, building blocks uh, that need to be there and we need to keep reminding everybody that these boring conversations need to happen and need to be extended. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vanya. John? Uh, just to pick up on the uh, explainability, I completely agree very strongly. In fact, the, in fact, my feeling is that if we're thinking about, we should be thinking about systems, AI systems being human-centric. And by that, I mean that they should be, in some sense, educational. They should be enhancing the understanding of the human operator in terms of perhaps dimensions that they had overlooked, but in terms of an deepening their understanding of the background, of the context, of the possibilities, for example, that could influence this particular decision. And through that, they are actually making that decision a richer decision. Um, and so they're enhancing the ability of the uh, decision to be made in the correct way. Thank you so much. Uh, and I would just to, 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 to say that on AI and elections, we will have a MOOC coming out just next month uh, because it is very timely when half of the world's population is going into elections and there are real risks. And we are also speaking about how to address some of these risks. Uh, we will have also, I mean, I have one printout. It is available online if anybody wants that. We will uh, publish in March also guidelines on the ethical use of generative AI in the judiciary. We did a survey on users uh, on to the uh, 35,000 members of the of this network, and and how do they actually use generative AI? And developed some some guidelines in this domain too. And um, I would like to thank, and I hope you join me in applauding these uh, the the panelists. And, uh, and thanks to the public, too, for, for having a very interactive uh, discussion. And I hope it was as enriching for you as it was for us. Thank you.